What if you could start all over again? What if you could take all that you know, all that you've learned, all that you're good at, and start a new life? You could let go of those mistakes that you made. You could be free of the shame of those past mistakes. You could be free of the pain from those times when you let your anger get the best of you. You could be free of those shudders that come from how you handled that one situation. You probably know the one that I'm talking about. I don't know it, but I have my own. But you know what I'm talking about. Perhaps you felt like Megamind. I don't know if you ever watched the movie Megamind, but in it it's a classic hero versus villain movie, except that the villain wins very early in the movie. And what happens is Megamind is the villain, and he begins to realize that without the superhero to fight he doesn't have a lot to live for anymore and at one point in the movie he gets into a conversation and the, and the person he's talking to says if only the world had a reset button and he says he says cryingly like i've looked into the reset button the science is impossible and the the the, the science behind a reset button may be impossible but what if you could Start again. What if you could let go of all of that and begin anew? You know, at Christmas time, we often think about the magic of Christmas and the Christmas season. And I'm not talking about, you know, Hallmark movies and whatnot. I'm talking about the amazing, grandiose display of God's love by sending his son to earth to be born of a virgin. We think about the angels that show up to people and guide them. And there's a lot of God's power on display at Christmas, but Christmas should also remind us of a new start, a new start that is offered to all of us. And we're in our Advent series, The Hymn, and we've been looking at the introduction to the Gospel of John, and this prologue was most likely a song or a hymn that the early church would sing that had some very powerful theological truths. And two weeks ago, we looked at the greatness of God. We looked at how this world tries to distract us from the greatness of God with little problems or, you know, like big desires and ads and things like that. And, and how Christmas is a time where we are forced to remember how great our God is and how much bigger he is than all of these distractions. And last week, we looked at how Jesus is the light of the world and in the darkness around us, Jesus shows us the reality of this world and brings life to us. Today, we move on to the third movement or strophe instead of the verses they use, movements. And so let's pray and take a look at the word of God. Father, we come before you today. Thankful for your word. Thankful for this time. Excited that we get to spend time in your word today and asking, we just ask you, Lord, that you would Give us wisdom and guidance as we look at it, that you would speak to us, challenge us, and guide us. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Let's take a look. We're in John chapter 1, verses 10 down through 13. This is what it says. He was in the world, and the world was created through him. And yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of a natural descent, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. See, here's the simple reality. This, verse, this passage tells us that the world rejects God, but through Jesus, we are offered a new start. The world rejects God, but through Jesus, we are offered a new start. Rejection is actually a theme throughout the Christmas stories. And no matter which one you look at, uh, you, you see rejection. You go to Matthew, you see that the Herod, the king, of, the king over Judah, right? Uh, he rejects Jesus. Jesus as king is rejected. And so Herod tries to kill Jesus. You go to the book of Luke and Jesus' parents show up in their ancestors' hometown and there's no room for them. So they end up staying in a stable and giving birth to Jesus in this unsanitary area surrounded by animals. In the book of John, rejection is clearly written out for us. Jesus came to his own, but they did not receive him. Here's the one who is God. 
who came into this world out of love for us, who, you know, us people who are lost, right, and, and living in darkness. And yet the world did not recognize its creator, did not recognize its master. And Jesus was destined to be an outsider in his own house. The prophet Isaiah warned Israel that they would not recognize, recognize the Messiah when he came, right? that he would be despised and rejected. Here's the one who comes with light and life and joy and peace, and he is left out in the cold. Here's the one who comes with freedom and hope and new life, and he is pushed to the very edges of society. And the problem is not so much that it happened once, but it still happens today. Where Jesus revealed himself to be more than just another man. He wasn't just a religious reformer. He wasn't just a moral teacher. He proved himself to be God when he died on the cross and came back to life. Right? Jesus' resurrection from the death is still the best way to understand what happened 30, you know, 2,000 years ago and what occurred after his death. And yet, we still reject him. We reject the life that he offers because we prefer to be in control. We prefer to be in control of our own lives. Now look at, I'm not talking to just those who are not Christians. Christians, I'm talking to us. Right? Rejection of Jesus still remains a struggle for us. What does rejection of, a Christian, of Jesus look like for us as Christians? Well, it looks like knowing what God would have us to do and not doing it. It looks like knowing that we have been called to a mission and not doing it. It looks like letting Christianity be about Sunday mornings, but not letting it touch any of the areas of our life. God, you can have my Sunday mornings, but you cannot have my Monday mornings. God, you can have my Sunday mornings. You can have my devotions in the morning, but you can't have the TV that I watch at night or the music that I listen to all day long. You know, earlier this week, as I was reading through the news, I came across this incredible case of hypocrisy. And because of young years, I'm not going to go into details. But suffice it to say, there's a fairly well-known couple, known uh, in the political realm for fighting for family values. However, it came out recently that they really don't believe in those family values in their own life or live them out. And I don't know what this person's faith is. I, I, I don't know if they're Christians or not, but their hypocrisy is quite astounding. And the sad thing is that this is common in this world. Right? We can want to follow God and do our best to follow God and still reject Him in some of the arenas of our life. God, you can have this, but not that. And rejection of God is really what leads to those moments in life that you look back at and you kind of shake your head like, oh, why did I do that? Why did I do that? Why did I make that decision? And I have plenty of those moments in my life when I look back and go, hmm, I can't believe I did that. But you know what? Not one time when I've been doing what God asks me to do has it left me shaking my head in sadness. Not, not one time have I ever talked to another Christian and I've heard them say, you know what? That moment that really makes me shudder when I think about it was that moment when I stepped out and did what God wanted me to do. When I surrendered to God, that thing that God wanted me to surrender. Instead, when those happen, we are left shaking our head at how great our God is. And it is those moments when we have rejected God that we open the doors for those head-scratching moments uh, uh, to come in. Those, oh my goodness, why did I do that? Why did I say that? Why did I act that way? But God offers us a restart. He offers us a restart. Look at what he says. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God, to those who believe in his name. So you are offered something extremely precious, the right to be adopted as children of God. And you might go, well, I already have parents. Why do I need to be adopted? Right? But that's us with our 21st century brains thinking. You see, in the great Greek and Roman world, when John was had you know, writing these things, the, the book of John was written, things were quite different, right? The Romans and the Greeks had a different way of thinking about adoption than we do. Nowadays, when we think about adoption, right, we, we think about a, parent, a, a child who doesn't have parents, right, and saying, 
This child needs parents, so I would adopt this child. We think about you know, a child whose parents are, are, are negligent, not good at, at what they're doing as parents, and, and this child needs to be protected, so they're unfit, and so we had, they get adopted so that someone can care for this child. But 2,000 years ago, when somebody was adopted, it was primarily done to find an heir. And somebody, most likely a a powerful, rich man, was saying, man, I don't have any sons to pass on all of my inheritance to. I need to adopt somebody. Or they'll look back and say, I I think my children are incompetent. I'm going to adopt a a son who is competent to handle my, my, you know, legacy. And this was actually really, really common amongst the Caesars. In fact, there was a period of time for about 97 years where every Caesar was followed by, you know, adopted their heir. And in some of these cases, when people were adopted back then, there were kind of like three or four different ways that you, you know, they could go about adoption. But in some of them, they would end up leaving their family. The person who was adopted would leave their family. They would leave behind their previous rights to inheritance. They would leave behind their family name. They'd keep their first name, leave their family name, and become someone else. They were remade. Their old life was left behind and they were made new and a new one was started. The reset button had been pushed. And Jesus offers that to us. He offers us a restart. The Bible assures us that when we come to God, we are made new. He cleanses us and makes us new. He gives us a fresh start. That offer is still true to us to this day. And as Christians, even as Christians, we can make mistakes. We can make those head-shaking mistakes that leave us feeling crippled. And when we feel like there is no coming back from them, but God offers us a fresh start. Every time that we come to Him. And this new life is filled with more than we can imagine. It offers a path to freedom from sin. It offers us hope in the times of darkness. It offers us love when we feel abandoned. It offers us peace in the turmoil. It offers us joy in the midst of struggle. It offers us an intimate relationship with the creator of this universe. Our very own creator, God Himself. And so what is it that you're struggling with? Well, Jesus came to earth 2,000 years ago to offer us something more than a life where we cringe randomly over the memories of our mistakes. Instead, he offers us a fresh start. And when those old memories come back to try and haunt us, a fresh start means that we get to say to them, that was the old me. That was my old self. I'm a child of God. I've left that behind. I've been forgiven. And when they appear in our mind's eye, we can say, I've been forgiven. And I'm free. And I've been made new. I've been adopted by God. See, Christmas is an opportunity for us to be adopted by God himself. He offers us a new life that can never be found in this world, but it only comes if we are willing to accept Jesus. To not reject him, but to accept him. And the reality is that we can do things our own way or we can become a child of God. Those are really the only two options. One or the other. And if we accept Jesus' offer, we get a new life. Do you want that? Well, it starts with accepting Jesus. And the beautiful thing is that, you know, in the Roman world, when they were looking to adopt somebody, you know what they would do? They would look at them and look at their history and look at, like, how well have they done with what they've been given? And if they've done well enough, then I'm willing to pass on my legacy to them, give them, you know, to to carry out my heritage, right, a path to, to make them my heir. But that's not the way with God. He offers adoption to all of us, no matter what we have done, so you can be a child of God, but it starts with accepting Jesus, and that means believing that he came to earth, that he lived, that he died, that he came back to life. It means asking for forgiveness of your sins. The Bible promises us that that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins. We just have to ask. And lastly, it means surrendering to him. And that's everything that it sounds like. Yes, it's it's making him king in our lives. It's doing what he would want us to do, acting the way he would want us to act. 
But only in doing this do we find freedom from things like sin. Only in doing this do we find hope and love and acceptance and joy. And so I encourage you, don't wait. You can do this simply by praying a prayer. You can accept Jesus simply by praying a prayer to God, by saying, God, I believe that you really did come, Jesus, that you came and died for my sins and you came back to life. Please forgive me for my sins. There are things that I have done wrong. Please forgive me of my sins. I want you to be master in my life. I surrender to you. I accept you, Jesus Christ, as my Savior. A simple prayer, talking to God in the same way that you would talk to anyone else. And if you have more questions, I'd be more than willing to sit down and talk with you about this. But I would encourage you, don't wait. Don't wait. Find life. Find Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you today just thankful for this remind, for remembering that you have all opened up the opportunity for us to be adopted as children of God if we will not reject you. If we will truly surrender to you, make you master in our life, Lord, that you will adopt us as your children. And I'm so thankful that I am now a child of God. And that you've done that not just for me, but for so many others. And I just ask, Father, that you would help us to live uh, in, in ways that you would have us to live, to not reject you in these different arenas of our life, but instead stay focused on you. Father, we ask these things in your name. Amen.